I was a slightly more seasoned engineer. Uh, I was above, you know, I, I was older and I had a little more industry experience. And they tapped me to go work on the infrastructure behind the Google web server, GWIS, as we called it. And GWIS was the infrastructure that served the Google homepage and the Google search results page, which were, uh, I think it was like, they were like, the, they, they, those two were like the top two properties, web properties in the world. Mm -hmm. And we were responsible for like making them like fast and reliable in all languages and all domains. And being able to push new changes to it on a weekly basis, right? Because you, you, you can't stagnate, like you have to forge ahead. You, you have to enable people to forge ahead. But the thing was a toxic mess, like because of the organic way that Google had grown, like no one was really marshalling it and cleaning it up and enforcing the rules. I mean, not no one, but it was very, very hard to do that. And um, as a result, it had gotten very messy and most of the engineers who worked on it didn't really wanna work on it anymore. And they were down to one engineer left in charge of the infrastructure, this guy named Todd Turnage. And uh, Todd was wanted to go do something else. And he'd been there long enough that he kind of earned the right to go spend like a couple of months on a 20% project that he was pretty excited about. But um, our senior director at the time, uh, Bill Corrin, convinced Todd to stick around for a couple of months and train me up on mm -hmm. this. So it was Todd and, and me. And our, you know, our job was to make sure that this thing continued to run and continue to, to be um, like flexible and adaptable and, and people could change it. And at that time, I'd say about, <laughs> about 100 engineers were making changes to this thing a week, okay. um, which you know, seems like a lot. Uh, but the challenge is that no one really understood exactly what it did, right? And so I remember sitting in a room with, with Bill Corrin and, and Kaz Nicolau, the directors of the time, and, and uh, they're looking at me and they're like, well, what are you gonna do on this? And I was like, well, okay, someone has to tell me what this thing does. And they really weren't sure how to interpret that comment. So they're like, well, what are you gonna do? And I was like, okay, I'm gonna write unit tests because I figure you know, a test is documentation. It's executable documentation. I'm gonna write this unit test. And this is uh, uh, something I had learned at VA Linux. Um, you know, our backs were to the wall at VA and we really needed to like figure out how to do better software development. We went and learned how to do this. And I brought this with me to Google. And it's not like people hadn't been writing unit tests, but like this project, GWIS, you know, we used to call the neck of Google. It was that soft, squishy thing that all the oxygen and blood and nerves and food and water and everything flowed through. And it was so fragile, right? It was mm -hmm. delivering search results with, with a couple of hundred millisecond latency, uh, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time or, or better. Um, and all of our ad revenue came through that. Like we had launched uh, AdSense. So like, it was like 98% of the revenue came from this thing. So if this thing was down for a minute, we lost revenue. If it was down mm -hmm. for like a second, we lost revenue. Like it was really like noticeable. Um, and so uh, we basically couldn't, we could, have, we could have rewritten it. I think the, the trending sentiment was like, let's rewrite it. But to rewrite it, you have to understand what it's doing because if you rewrite it and you leave out some critical features, like how are you ever going to transition to it? And meanwhile, while you're rewriting it, a hundred engineers are contributing to it. So my argument was, let's go write unit tests. Let's understand it deeply. Then let's use those tests to create invariance in the system. And then let's start cleaning it up while not breaking any invariance. And so basically I used unit tests to create a culture of understanding and a culture of like a safety net. Like if you check in some code and it breaks the unit test, well then you can't ship it because we know there's a breakage. And if it doesn't break a unit test, you can commit it. And if it breaks something in production, okay, fine, we'll fix it and we'll write a new unit test. So you just ratchet it tighter and tighter and tighter. So by the end of 2004, I'd put out a manifesto basically saying, anyone who wants to make changes to GWIS and because of my role as an infrastructure guy, the only infrastructure guy, I, I could be a gatekeeper for it. I basically was like, if you want to make changes to this, you have to write a unit test. And this caused massive consternation. All these people were super upset. So people were like, I don't need to write unit tests. My code is perfect. And there were some hilarious uh, techniques I used to get people to write unit tests. And, and that's a, I mean, some of them are very funny. Um, but we basically use this because of the place that Google was in and the, the moment in time and the place that I happened to sit and the experience that I had, I was able to basically just put this speed bump in front of everything and be like, you have to write a unit test. Mm -hmm. And that started to shift the culture of the engineering 
in the company towards writing unit tests because they were like, oh, as soon as, okay, so I'll, I'll, tell, you, I'll tell you a quick aside. An engineer would come to me and they would submit some code and they would say, uh, please uh, review this and submit it. I need it to go out live on Monday. It's gonna make us a lot of money. And I'd say, okay, that's great. Uh, you know, well, they, we weren't so money focused. They'd be like, it's a great feature for the users. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, uh, it would drive engagement and very often like it would, it would be very monetizable, but like it, we actually were not super money focused. That was one of the great things about Google. Um, sometimes I forget just how idealistic we were back then. <laughs> but the engineers would say like, hey, my code's perfect, no issues. And so uh, what I would do is I would go, I'd be like, okay, write a unit test. They'd be like, I don't want to write a unit test. It's really important. So I'd write a unit test for them. I'd be like, okay, fine. You may understand this, but I don't really understand this. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd write a unit test. And very often, if I was diligent, my unit test would find a bug in their code that I could not find through code review. And because mm -hmm. it would be very complex. It was a very complex, intertangled, code base that was very difficult to parse. So very often it was hard to find these things like in code review. And so then what I would do is I would send them this unit test and be like, listen, I wrote one for you. Uh, just go ahead, add it to your change list, make sure it passes and you could submit. So then they would take the unit test. They would run the unit test. It would fail and they would find a bug in the code that they had sworn up and down, had no bugs. They would go fix the bug. And then you could tell because Perforce was set up, I could, you could tell after whether or not they made some changes, sometimes they would fess up to it and be like, your test found a bug. I will write a test in the future. Sometimes they try to sneak it by and be like, oh no, that was kind of funny. But what happened was for those people, the next time they sent me code and I'd be like, write a unit test. They'd be like, fuck, he's found a bug mm -hmm. and he's gonna humiliate. I mean, not like humiliate, but they're like, they're like they, they didn't wanna be in the situation. So then they would start writing tests. And eventually they get to the point they just like, just tell me where the bug is. And I'd be like, no, 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 you have to write a test. You have to do it. And the funny thing about this, and I didn't really plan this, was it was viral. So when someone got stung like this, they would want to pass it on. So the next person, they'd be like, you write a test, you know? And it spread, it spread, mm -hmm. it spread to all these other projects where people were like, we would use unit tests as a way to actually do better code reviews. And engineers did not want to be responsible for putting a bug into the system. And so we use this to not only ratchet more tightly the technology and the process, but the culture. Like we demonstrated value in testing and it was only possible because we sat at the very center of what uh, drove people's brand perception of Google, the value proposition to users and the monetization. And so, I, I mean, I was very fortunate to sit in this moment and I was, you know, I didn't plan to do this, but I could see when it started working when it started turning over, that it was beginning to really shift the culture. Um, and then that spread, it, you know, uh, it spread rapidly throughout the company. Um, and then one of the benefits of the fact that the company was growing so fast, you know, we were like doubling or tripling is that the new people who came in just kind of accepted that as the status quo. In fact, we used to do this great trick where like we were trying to convince the old guard to write tests and they didn't really want to because they were like, it used to work just fine. We're going to keep doing that. So we decided to do, I got together with, we formed this thing called the testing grouplet. And grouplets were like a 20, a group of people working on a 20% project. And I worked with uh, Antoine Picard and Nick Leziaki and he and I did it together. Uh, the three of us did it together. Um, and um, one of them, I forget, came up with this idea that we would, as part of the two week onboarding process, teach a class on unit tests. And so we were doing this and we were getting some uptake. And then one of the guys who did, one of the, one of the guys who did was a, a frequent um, teacher, I think it was Chris Lopez, uh, came up with the idea that we would just tell all the noodlers that the status quo throughout the whole company is that everyone writes unit tests. We just be like, we just stated mm -hmm. like a fact. Oh, everyone writes unit tests. Unit tests are like, this is a culture, it's, it's unit mm -hmm. tests. And, and then what would happen is these new groups would wind up in a group that didn't write the tests. And we would tell them, oh, it's okay. Like, you know, that's one of the older groups, but like, you know, you, you can help them. And so what happened was we kind of did this like bear hug to the older engineers where it's all of a sudden everyone around them was just like, I was told that we write unit tests. So here's my unit test, right? And so that actually created this massive upswell towards rigor and discipline about building like, like heavy duty systems at scale 
that, that we had the ability to modify safely and confidently because we had a good safety net to know that they weren't gonna fail. And that transition probably only took about a year. But mm-hmm. in that critical moment, when we were going from like 2000 engineers to 6,000 to 18,000, uh, it like, it became foundational to the engineering organization and it shifted the way people thought. We did all kinds of other hilarious, funny things. We, you know, I could talk for hours about it, but, 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 but actually the, the trick to getting it to happen at scale was cultural. The mm-hmm. technology existed. The processes were there. It was getting the culture to shift. 